I invite you to turn with me to, uh, to the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to be looking in chapter 12 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 12. And uh, I've got to actually get turned there just a second. I was in 2 Corinthians. It's not the same as 1 Corinthians. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not be for, th for that reason to stop being a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is... There are many parts, but one body. Now, if I were to say to you, uh, the great equalizer, does anybody know what the answer to that riddle is? Anybody want to venture? What do they all say the great equalizer is? Death, right? Death is the great equalizer. At the end, we all go in the grave. At the end, it's all done. Death. Okay. Now, for the Christian, however, there is another equalizer, and that is the blood of Jesus. Now, it's also death, but because Jesus has been given the right to suffer death for you and me, the blood of Jesus becomes the great equalizer for the body of Jesus. And so all of us, while out in the world, the world may treat you differently. It may be based on your financial situation. It may be based upon the number of friends that you have. It may be based on the influence that you carry. Uh, it may be based on just whether they know you or not. You know, when it comes to jobs, a lot of times that people say this, they say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And if you happen to know the boss, you got a better chance of getting the job than if you don't. There's all kinds of things that happen in the world that aren't supposed to be in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, it should not matter Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, you know, man or woman, those kinds of things shouldn't matter. What matters here, we're all a part of the same body. And a lot of times, unbelievers will look at the church and they will say, well, I got to get my act together before I go to church. I suppose that they must think that in church everybody's perfect. I don't know. Some folks have said, oh, if I ever went into your church, why, the roof would fall down in on me. I don't know where they ever got that idea. Has anybody ever walked into a church building and the roof fell down on them? Where did that saying come from? I have no idea, but lots of people will say to me that. But here you are in church, Look around you. I pose to you a question today. 
where are the better people? In the body of Christ, there are no better people. This is what the Bible is telling us. We're all part of one body. We're all members of one body. Let's explore it together. First of all, the body is a unified whole. So we're going to talk a little bit here about unity. Now, in the world, their ideas of unity are different than God's idea of unity. Not only that, but you'll find out that this actually applies out in the world or here. It's just out in the world they deny that it's true. Okay, but it is true. Unity, if it is compromised, legalized, or socialized, it's fake unity. Okay? What's the big deal in, the, in politics? We've got to strike a compromise. We've got to have politicians that will compromise. What does compromising mean? Well, if you're standing for what is right, compromise means allowing some wrong in what you're standing for. That's what it means. If what you're standing for is right, it means you're compromising with what is wrong. Can you compromise with what's wrong and have unity? No. But people say that you can, and they call that unity. That's not unity. It's fake. The people that believe they're right on either side of an issue are going to continue to believe that they're right. And they won't be unified in heart, only unified in behavior, and that's fake. What if we legalized unity? That's what socialism wants to do. It wants to legalize unity. It wants to force everybody to be unified. By law, you have to be unified. You have to think like each other. You have to be like each other. I'm reminded of a commercial back in the 1980s by Wendy's, the, uh, the, the, the hamburger stand. And in the one commercial, why they had a, at the time, the, so, the, the, the uh, poster child for socialism was the Soviet Union. And so they used the Soviet Union and Russian accent and all of that, you know, for the commercial. And I don't know if you recall the commercial, but at the, at the beginning of the commercial, we have a fashion designer that is basically standing at the microphone and she says, next day wear. And this woman comes out in a gray outfit with a gray scarf and walks down the catwalk and then turns around and walks back down. And they say, next evening wear. And so she comes out the exact same outfit and walks out and down and they go, oh, very nice. And then, then she says, is next swimwear. And she comes out with the exact same outfit, but with a beach ball. Walks down. Oh, very nice. You see, this is what socialism is. Socialism is legalized unity, where everybody is supposed to look the same, be the same, have no more than anybody else, no less than anybody else. It eventually, though, actually winds up bringing everybody down to the same level. Not up to the same level, down to the same level. It's fake. Okay? Legalized, compromised, socialized. Fake, fake, fake. And the world is trying to go for the fake unity right now. Now, we also have another kind of unity. It's, it's, it's committed unity or promised unity. Okay? Now, we have committed unity between married people. We have committed unity between partners in a firm. Okay? In a business. Uh, we have promised unity, which is, uh, you know, which is between, uh, you know, people that are engaged or, or people that are under contract. But all of that is conditional unity. Okay? They, the, the commitment of unity in, in a married couple is, is conditional upon the two members of that married couple remaining committed. Because if at any point one of them is no longer committed to the marriage, the marriage will fall apart or begin to decay at least. And the unity will be broken up. Many marriages 
are committed, but inside, they're not unified. Many, uh, ma many promises that we have made for unity to others, people have promised, but inside they're not unified. There is only one kind of unity that is real unity, and it is natural unity. Okay, a, a vine has a, it has a, a trunk and it has branches. A tree has a trunk and it has branches and it has leaves. And that whole tree is unified because it is natural for it to be unified. The body, your body, my body, is unified because it is natural for it to be unified. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I know that I talk with my hands. And so the whole time I'm sitting here talking, I become aware, oh, my hands are moving around while I'm talking because I'm expressing myself. Okay, now this does not mean that I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, oh, what kind of expression should I use? I'm going to force my hands to make those expressions. No, my hands make the expressions that they do while I'm talking because they're a part of a unified whole. It's a natural unity between my mind and my body. And because it's natural, it's real unity. Now, God calls for the church to be unified. But I have seen preachers preach sermons on unity, and the, what they have said is we need to compromise. Oh, the Bible says we have to be unified. Or they say, well, what's the community going to think if we're not unified? Fake. Fake, 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 fake. You will never hear me preach a sermon that says, come on, everybody, we got to get unified here. Fake. Oh, we're committed to each other. Oh, we love each other as a church. Conditional. Conditional. What if somebody in your church just decides this isn't for them? What if a whole faction of the church decides this isn't for them? That's conditional unity, folks. God doesn't call us to conditional or fake unity. He calls us to real unity, natural unity. He is one God he is one Christ, he is one spirit, and we are called into that one being. So let's talk about natural unity. The Bible says that we are one body, but we are dependent upon one mind. Just take, a, take a thought on that for a second, okay? If you think your body doesn't need your mind, then take your head, detach it from your body, and set it on a shelf, and see how long either of you survive. Not going to be long, is it? <laughs> Before long, why, one or the other is going to die first. But eventually the whole being dies. You see, your unity to Jesus Christ as a Christian is just that natural. It's just that, if I can use the word organic, And because it is that organic, you cannot separate yourself from Christ without starting the process of death. You cannot commit a sin that separates you from God and expect there to be continuing vital Christian life. You cannot stop studying the Bible. You cannot stop praying without death beginning to set in. Because either of those things, you're, you stay connected to God through three things. Your connection to God is based on your understanding of the word, and that can come through many ways. I mean, if you're, if you're not a reader, some folks are just not readers. If you're not a reader, you can always get a CD where they read the Bible for you and talk to you, okay? <laughs> then there's also your prayers. You can also pray to the, to the Lord and talk to him. And then they're sharing the Lord with other people. 
Through those three things, you stay connected. Okay? And by staying connected, you maintain life. If I cut a branch off from a tree, does the branch stay alive? For a little bit, it does, actually. But what's eventually going to happen to it? It's going to die, right? Eventually, it's going to die. Okay, so we are one body. We're dependent on one mind. Jesus is the mind of this body. Now, he's not the mind of the body because you say, okay, I'm going to make Jesus the mind. Okay, I'm going to compromise. Okay, I'm going to commit. Jesus is the mind. No, he's only the mind of you. He's only the mind of the body that you're a part of if you have submitted to it and have allowed unity to take place. Jesus says this. He says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But it is God's will that through me you can produce fruit. Okay, so with that in mind, we have to pause and ask ourselves, do I want to produce fruit in my life? And if I want to produce fruit in my life, then I'd probably better stay connected so that as a branch I don't get cut off and die, I'd better stay connected. And so even if, I, even if I have a bad connection, it's still a connection. I mean, I've seen branches on trees that are like kind of leaning off. They've broken a little bit, but they're still connected. And even through that little bit of connection, that's still enough to get sap out to the leaves and keep the leaves growing. It's the same thing with you. Even if your connection isn't what it ought to be, if it's at least some connection, you're better off than none at all. Because none at all, you die. Some, you live, but it's a struggle. But a good connection, not only do you live, but it just feels right. It feels natural. One spirit serving one purpose. God has given you his Holy Spirit. And he has given it to you because he has something he wants to do through you. And the Bible says that that thing is producing fruit. And what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. <clears throat> Things that without those fruits in your life, you're not going to have the happy joyful, peaceful, wonderful, blessed life that you would like to have. Because every good thing flows from those fruits that I just gave you. And then last of all, we're many parts, but we're in natural harmony with each other. Now this is, you know, all things considered healthy. You know, all things considered healthy. We're in a natural harmony with one another. Okay, right now I can tell you, my feet are a little swollen because I'm standing up for a long period of time. I can tell you that that's the truth. Now, I probably would never confront you with that. I would probably never say, hey, yeah, guess what? My feet are swollen. <laughs> but standing here for a long time, being the weight that I am, yeah, they're swollen, okay? Is that going to stop me, though, from doing what I need to do? No. My mind acknowledges that that's the case. My body compensates, I lean to this way, I lean to that way. My body works in harmony to keep all of the different things that are going in on my body. Right now, while I'm talking to you, my body is constantly adjusting, constantly working in natural harmony so that I can achieve what it is I'm called upon to achieve right now, delivering a message from God to the people. And so here I stand, and my body's working in harmony. Your body is working in harmony right now. All things considered, everything being natural. And even if you have a little bit of a disease, your body is sidestepping all of that in order to keep your being in harmony and in as good a health as you can be. And so natural unity works this way. 
it's natural that your body does what your head tells it to do. The spirit is like the blood in your body. And where's the most blood contained in your body? Where is the most blood? Does anybody know any, any anatomy people in here? Up here, right? Where's the biggest concentration of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ? Around Christ, who is the head of the body. Okay, but does that, but does that blood just go up to the head and stay there? No, it goes up to the head and then goes back, goes on a trip around through the body and back up again. So also the Holy Spirit strengthens the whole body. The same spirit that is in Christ is the same spirit that is in the Christian. And that spirit nourishes you as much as it nourishes Christ. And what it gains from being up in Christ, it delivers throughout the whole body. We have a natural unity with Christ. One that we don't have to force. One that we don't have to make happen. One we just have to admit exists. And then submit to it. Last of all, there are no better people. There's just no better people. Feet, eyes, hands, ears, they're all parts, and they are all servants. You might say, wow, the eyes, they get to do such neat things. They get to see everything and all of that. Yeah, but you know what? Do the eyes get to do anything with what they see? No. Everything that the eyes see are to help the rest of the body do what it needs to do. The eyes are servants to the mind and to the rest of the body. What about the ears? Well, not only is there hearing, but there's balance in there as well. And those ears are servants. Do they get to do anything with what they hear? No. Everything that they hear is for the rest of the body so that the body knows what to do. So those things that seem more dynamic in our body actually get to be dynamic for one reason, to help the rest of the body. What about the feet? They get to carry us on all kinds of journeys, right? But they have the weight of the body on them. They hold up the body. They get to see places and go places. But the weight of the whole body is upon them. And while they may be servants that get to go places and do things, they carry with them the weight of the whole body. So every one of the parts of the body of Christ are the same. You're all servants to Christ. There's no better servant. There's no super servant. There's no important servant and unimportant servant. We are all servants. And if we do what Christ tells us to do, the body works in beautiful, natural harmony. And as a church, we're able to achieve great and wonderful things, not because we forced ourselves to be unified, not because we've compromised ourselves into it, but because we have just stopped trying to be anything except servants of the Most High God. And you and I are. There's no better servant than an obedient servant. Okay? <laughs> I mean, if I've got a hand and an arm and it's paralyzed, and I can say to that hand and that arm all day long, hey, do something. Hey, come on, do something. I can yell at it. Come on, arm, do something. If it's been cut off because it's no longer receiving nervous messages from my mind, it's not an obedient servant. It's not very useful to me as an arm, other than to do this. And folks, God calls on us to be obedient servants. Not just servants, not just admitting, oh, I'm a servant. But actually doing something with that. When God lays something on your heart, do it. If you're reading through the prayer list 
and you say, hey, I know that person. Call them. Go to their home. Hey, how are you doing? Can I pray with you? Let the Lord lay someone upon your heart. I used to sing a chorus when I was a kid. My dad used to lead it, lead it in our church. And the, the chorus went like this. It said, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I ever do my part to win that soul for thee. Saw a couple of people mouthing. You know that chorus. That's our prayer. That's our prayer as a church. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I ever do my part to win that soul for thee. What a wonderful prayer. You see, now that's a prayer that only comes from the Lord. It doesn't come out of the flesh. <laughs> out of the flesh is, is, Lord, get those souls away from me. They're giving me a headache. That's what comes out of the flesh. That's not, we don't operate in the flesh. We operate in the spirit. In Christ, folks, we are unified. Don't look around and say to yourself, wow, so-and-so is really poor. Oh, so-and-so is really rich. Don't do that. That comes from the devil. That comes from the enemy. Don't look around and say to yourself, oh, well, so-and-so, why, uh, they said this or they said that. And Who cares what? If we are part of the body, there's joy. If somebody is violating that and they're causing division, you need to pray for them and ask the Lord to intervene. When people are hurting, when people are in sin, call out to the Lord and pray. There is no better part. You have to come to the Lord as you are. Whether you're the foot, whether you're the knee, whether you're a little mitochondria that goes around the cell and delivers nourishment to one little cell, whatever part of the body you are, you need to be that part. Thank God for a part in his body and work with others as brothers and sisters don't do it out of force. Don't do it out of fakery. But do it because it is true. Because it is real. <laughs>